Um, once upon a time, there's a little boy and a little girl who woke up in their prospective houses, different houses, and it was a Sunday morning, and they both decided that they were going to go to church. Little boy was a Baptist, little girl was a Catholic, and they put on their very best, their very best underwear, their very best socks. The little girl put on just a beautiful dress, little patent leather black shoes, ribbons in her hair. Her mom did her up, and the little boy put on a suit and a clip-on tie and a beautiful white shirt and wingtip shoes, and they both started off to church. And somewhere along the line, they didn't know each other, somewhere along the line, their streets converged, and so they saw each other, and, and they greeted each other, and um, the little girl said, you know, I'm going to church, and the little boy said, I'm going to church too, and he said, uh, what's your church? And she said, I'm a Catholic, and she said, what's yours? He said, I'm a Baptist, and so they proceeded to walk along, and they were talking, they were making small talk about the morning and everything and getting to know each other. And they went on down the road, and they realized that there had been a flood, and the road was flooded, and there was a stream of water washing across the road. So they stopped, and they looked at that. And she said, well, you know, oh, my, my church is over, you know, I go down the road, and then I, I, I go to the left, and it's out that way. And he says, yeah, my church, I go down the road, and it's off to the right, and I go that way. They looked at each other, they didn't know what to do, because... What they shared with each other was, you know, if I go into that water and I get my clothes ruined, my, my mom is going to be so upset with me. You know, this is my best dress. This is my best suit. This is my best everything, my best underwear, my best socks, my best shoes. So they looked at each other for a while, and they decided kind of at the same time to completely strip everything off, just take all their clothes off all their clothes and all their underwear and everything, and they, and they took their, off their perspective outfits and they folded them up very carefully and they held them above their heads and they began to wade across the water. So they went out there and sure enough the water was, you know, came up about chest high, but it wasn't flowing too, too, uh, too strong and so they got through. And so they're standing on the other side, and there was nothing really to dry off with, so they're just kind of trying to shake the water off. They're looking at each other and they got their clothes over there and and so anyway, so they finally kind of got dried off, and they, they both got dressed again, and they started down the road. And the fork in the road was very close, and so they were about ready to part company. So when they turned to each other to say goodbye, the little boy said to the little girl, he says, you know, he says, until this morning, I didn't realize the big differences between Catholics and Baptists. So. <laughs> It's really interesting how metaphysics works. I've been thinking this week about unity and oneness because that's what I knew I wanted to talk about. And the principle in new thought that we have around oneness and that we embrace. And so sure enough, I was at the farmer's market this week, which I've been several weeks. And every week has been great. You know, people come by and they're interested in the center and they take a pamphlet and we talk and stuff. And there hasn't been any, any kind of religious rancor at all or any kind of, you know, anything like that. People who walk by and kind of figure out who we are, who don't necessarily agree with us, just kind of keep on going. Until this week. I had a gentleman come up and I know that he has a lot of concerns about my soul. And I, and I respect that. <laughs> And I know that he has, a, he has a very different way of looking at religion and the world and God, and he engaged me in a conversation. And it was a conversation that was challenging for me because he represented a place that I had come from once in my life. And so there is that, um, there is that emotional hold. You know, we, when we say as human beings that someone pushed our button, that's because that button is wired to something that we have an emotional attachment to. And so, um, and, and I think, I, you know, there were, there were some people present. You can find them and ask them how I did. I, I was respectful. I, I re, you know, I, I think that I did a good job representing what we believe, and I respected him, and I was loving, and all that good stuff. But I found it challenging. I found that, 
you know, it's interesting because by that time in the week, I had read all kinds of stuff on oneness, and, you know, one of the pieces I read you this morning by Ernest Holmes, it's all one and all that sort of thing, and then suddenly it shows up, the division. It shows up, the conflict. And, 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 and how it is so easy for us to grab a hold of that. Now, the piece I read this morning to start the service, I don't know how well you remember that, but the piece that I read this morning was Ernest Holmes coming to things very much from a scientific point of view. He talks about one principle, one God, one intelligence. And so basically what Holmes is asking us to do with that is he says, as a scientist, let's look down the microscope, and if you look far enough down the microscope into the molecular matter, the, the atomic area of us, you know, what the physicists are doing, look down there, to the very basic building blocks of life, you will find out that it's all one. What Holmes was saying is, as you look at my body standing here today, and you look at this podium, made out of the same stuff. You know, the chair you're sitting in, and you, made out of the same stuff. When you walk out into the back parking lot today, and there's a squirrel running up a tree, that squirrel and you, the same stuff. That's what Holmes was saying. And some of us are a little squirrelier than others, so we can relate to that, okay? Some of us are a little nuts. Like <laughs> anyway, so Holmes, Holmes was looking at it from a very scientific point of view. But as we live our lives, as we live our lives, how do we see this oneness? And so I want to read another piece for you. And this is a combination of two writers that I pulled together, Ernest Holmes and a gentleman by the name of John Lee, who is a contemporary spiritual writer in the spiritual men's movement. The first piece is Holmes, and the second piece belongs to John Lee, and I kind of brought them together. So we listened, we listened to Holmes earlier, right? You know, one God, one principle, one mind, one matter, okay? One substance. Now listen to Holmes now. Through the prism of God's love. I love that. Through the prism of God's love, I recognize the oneness of infinite spirit in all universal expression, providing me with perfect insight right now. That's gorgeous. Through the prism of God's love, I recognize the oneness of infinite spirit in all universal expression, providing me with perfect insight right now. Now, the second piece is John Lee, and I brought him in because I think that he kind of elaborates a little bit. John Lee says, Emotions are body wisdom that, if suppressed, can be rediscovered. There comes a time when we know our own happiness, sorrow, peace, conflict, joy, sadness, connectedness, loneliness. Then we throw off our acquired fears, facing and experiencing the truth of our feelings, ushers us into the world of humanity, of oneness. Humanity. And when I, was, when I, when I read this piece and I, and I had this experience this week, with this person at the farmer's market, and I thought, you know, what is it? What is it that keeps us separate? What are those, what are those things that we get hung up in? Where Ernest Holmes says we need, to, we need to tweak our vision in using the prism of love. And what made me think of it was, and I mentioned Mark Twain last week, and Mark Twain, you know, his seminal work, his seminal piece that he will always be known for throughout history, is Huckleberry Finn. And, the, and the, the, if you were to go online today and you were to read the one paragraph that an academic has said about, Tom, about Huckleberry Finn, it would say, it's a story of the, of the development of a relationship between a young white boy and a, and a, and a black slave in the South on a raft trip down a river. Okay? It says the development of a relationship. But see, I would disagree with that. I remember being a young teenager and reading Huckleberry Finn. I decided to read it during the summer. Um, I read it partially out of rebellion because, 
You know, when I was a little kid, I'd read Tom Sawyer, and I thought it was wonderful, and I'd talk to my mom about Huckleberry Finn, and she said, no, you don't want to read that. I mean, that's, that's got some pretty dark, ugly stuff in it. So, of course, to me, that was like, I'm going to go read it, you know. So um, whatever she said not to do, I did, and so she'd tell me, I do not want you to rake that yard. Okay, well, I will, you know. <laughs> Boy, I got over on her. <clears throat> so anyway... Um, I remember I was a young teenager, I was probably about 13, I decided to read it over a summer, and I, I had really started to explore literature outside of Christian literature and some other things, and it was, I think that for me it was that kind of leaving childhood and becoming a little bit of a, you know, whatever the next stage is. So I read it, and I'm not, I've never been a real fast reader, so it took me several weeks to read it, and especially Huckleberry Finn, it was so thick and so heavy. And I was expecting Tom Sawyer. And that's not what I got. Huckleberry Finn is, uh, took on, at that particular time in our history, took on the most blatant uh, duality, separation, that our, our society could ever imagine. It, w it got into slavery. It got into the South. It got into... It got into the difference between black and white. It got into racism. It got into classism. It, it looked at poverty. It looked at wealth. It looked at everything. It was an amazing book. And I watched, and this was the first time in my life, when I watched what unfolded over several pages was two people who could not be more different coming together over their humanity over what it was to be a human being, over love and sorrow and aspiration and dreams and loneliness and connection and abandonment and shame and joy. And it was amazing to me. And the amazing thing to me about, about, uh, about Mark Twain was that here I was, you know, a white kid living in Northern California in the 20th century. This was a story that was in the 19th century in the South on a river. You know, one of the characters was a kid who was kind of an outcast. His father was the town drunk, a runaway slave on a raft. And I felt connected to them. I felt their humanity. I felt my own humanity. And Twain was able to bridge a century almost. He was able to bridge race and color and class and conflict with the idea of how we come together as human beings. To, to bridge our differences in terms of our humanity. And you don't, sometimes we don't I, don't, I don't think we use the word humanity enough with spirituality because spirituality is that invisible thing out there. It's God, it's all that stuff. And, 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 and what, what Holmes is talking about through the prism of God's love and what Twain talked about through the prism of shared emotional experience, we come together in humanity. And it's humanity that builds the bridge of oneness. Because I don't know about you, but I don't live my life in terms of looking through a microscope with a white lab coat on all the time. I live my life through emotion, through connection. I live my life through shared events. I live my life in humanity. And the other night, when I had this encounter with this person... The next day, or the next couple of days, that was Thursday night, and so Friday and Saturday, I thought a lot about it, and I, I was, I, I didn't, I, I wished, I don't want to beat up on myself, I wish that I had been able to, to step into a place of humanity as opposed to religion. Because... You know, what, what showed up at the table was all the religious dogma and doctrine and belief. And I tried to, I tried to, I tried to stand in that space. And I should have shifted into the space of humanity. In terms of what we are all looking for. And that's what John Lee talks about. John Lee basically says, what is it that we connect with? 
It's the way we feel about things. It's our aspiration, our love, our peace, our joy, what we've accomplished, what we haven't accomplished. All of those things that we've been through. This week, I went to a Silomar, as you know, and I had one of the most amazing personal experiences. And, and I, I am so, I can't thank the leadership of the center enough for sending me and for you financing it because I had a personal experience that was amazing. And I want to talk about it in, in terms of the idea of oneness. You know, as you know, or may not know, it doesn't really matter once upon a time, Centers for Spiritual Living was two organizations that came from the same place. And years ago, there was decades ago, there was a breakup and people got mad. They went different directions. And so in the last um, several years, because our leadership said, hey, you know, we, we teach oneness. I mean, that's why I'm talking about this day, because New Thought teaches oneness. But we're not practicing oneness. We're separate. And so there was a, bit, a movement that's gone on for many years to bring us together into one organization. Now, in the meantime, when we were living differently, of course, both those sides developed their own cultures, how they did things, what they valued, what they didn't value, on and on and on. Okay. And so as someone who's a, a minister, I, my, I came up through and was trained in the ministry of what used to be called International Centers for Spiritual Living, and the other one was called um, United Centers for Spiritual Living. So I was on the international team, right? And they were on the United team, all those people over there. I can tell by the way they walk that they're united. <laughs> I can tell how they dress, you know. So I came up through ministry, and I was involved in, in, in our association of churches, and then this began to happen. And, I, and in the years past, I've been involved in some committees and some stuff, and I'd be on these phone calls with people from all over the country and working out the business part of it and the, the doctrine part of it and the, you know, the logistics of it. And I'd be on these phone calls, and maybe there'd be six or seven or eight of us on there, and I could just tell by the way they were talking if they were united or not, or if they were international, you know. And, and so I, I, could, I could talk all good and everything, but somewhere within me was this, you know, us and them kind of thing. And every once in a while, when I would go to conferences, because now the conferences are blended, and they said, isn't this great? We can all come together. Well, what was interesting for me was that you would get all of us in a big ballroom in some hotel, and you would see the tribes begin to form. And there would be a few people who'd go back and forth, but, you know, I don't know. I, to me, they were kind of like double agents, you know, or something. <laughs> so, so... And then they would mix up the speakers, the United speakers, the international speakers, and they'd leave, and you'd listen to several speakers in the night, and you'd walk out at the end of the night, and I'd think, oh, man, those, you know, and I would think about all the great international speakers, and, well, the United speakers were okay, and I'll give them a break, you know, and they, they did make a good point and things like that. And so there's this, there's this part of us that kind of gets hung up in the difference somehow. And so I, I think that us coming together is wonderful and all that sort of thing, but I had to admit there was a place in me that lived in this place of, you know, well, they're trying to change us, and are they listening to us, and them, and they, and them, and they, and them, and they, and us, and them, and I would hear it in my verbiage. And so for me, if I'm really honest with myself and with you, you know, there was a part of me that kind of held out a little bit emotionally. Okay, but I'm supposed to be a teacher of oneness. So in my class, oh yes, oneness. We have to we have to get along with the Mormons and the Baptists and the Catholics. Isn't this just wonderful? But I can't even get along with the United. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so if I'm being really honest, because there was difference, there was something different, and so um, so I go down to Asilomar and we get the message on Tuesday. There, I don't know how many of you have been to the Asilomar grounds, but in the middle, kind of in the middle of the area where there is a, a large uh, place to eat and there's a large administration building and there's a large sort of a gathering building to the left and then of course there's all these other buildings that kind of go up from the ocean. In the middle is this thing called the meadow and it, you know, calling it a meadow is optimistic, it's not that big, but it's really beautiful. It's an open space, got some trees, some of that tall coastal grass that's really neat and on the real kind of damp days of the coast, it's very, the grass is moist, and it's really this wonderful place. There's some picnic tables there. Well, United, uh, when they produce ministers every year, 
they would come to Asilomar. And we, and we, you know, both sides, we always did our once a year conference at Asilomar, but we did it different weeks, you know. And sometimes we put a week in between because we just wanted their stuff out of there. We didn't, we didn't want to ever, we didn't want to accidentally run across any United stuff, you know, any of their energy, you know. So anyway, uh, it's interesting we both met at the conference and both uh, associations, when you became a minister, the final thing, the final panel that you went through to become a minister after all your education was at Asilomar, and both groups did that. But United did something that International never did, and what they did was they, they, they used the meadow that was there, they would set up an arch, you know, one of those small arches you see at weddings now and stuff outside, and they would cover this arch with ribbons, and there would be affirmations, there would be words like love and peace and joy, and they would have pictures of people like Ernest Holmes and Emma Curtis Hopkins, and they'd have ribbons coming off it. So they did this whole thing where as the ministers went through their panels and were approved, then they, it, it was called Walk the Meadow. And they walked the meadow, and as they walked the meadow, the people who were involved in this would blow horns and they'd have streamers and they'd have noisemakers and, and they would cheer and yell and the person would come through the arch and they would be greeted. And then after all the loudness and raucousness, then they would settle into a place where a group of people would surround them in a circle and pray for their ministry. Knowing knowing that their ministry was whole, complete, and divine, knowing that the infinite potentiality was there. And, you know, so, so in other words, when a minister goes through this, and now they're a minister, and they're going to be going into the world, and who knows, who knows on the material level what lies before them. But what is, is known that day is that you are loved, and the truth of you is that you are going to have a great ministry. And your ministry is truly blessed. And this movement is blessed because you're a minister. Well, a couple of years ago, I sat on the edge of the meadow and I watched this. And I thought, oh my God, this would be so cool. You know, I, I didn't go through it because I was international and we didn't do that, you know. And so... Um, I watched these people come through, and I, I found myself very emotional, and I thought this was just wonderful. Okay. So this year, I, I'm at Asilomar on Monday, and Monday there's this big announcement that goes out and says, tomorrow, which is Tuesday, at 1.15, every single minister in this place meet at the meadow. Okay. They didn't tell us why. There's a minister by the name of Barbara Waterhouse who's just a wonderful minister. She, she was united, but she's good. Okay. <laughs> she's a really wonderful lady. And um, so we get there, and there's hundreds of us there. And we're kind of milling around. And, you know, once again, the tribes are kind of separating, and people are talking to who they talk to, and they know and stuff. So she comes, and she asks everyone to get in a circle. And she said, I know that there are a lot of you here today who never got to walk the meadow. And today, you will walk the meadow. <clears throat> so, um, those of us who were going to walk the meadow, who had never walked it before, who never had the chance, we were told to get in the middle of the meadow. And um, we were surrounded by everybody else who had walked it before, and they held us in prayer. And there were, you know, probably a couple of hundred of us who had never walked the meadow. So then she said, okay, now go up to the other end of the meadow and you will walk down one at a time. And, you know, I, you know, as an adult, when you do some of these experiential things, you're kind of self-conscious and stuff. And you kind of, I don't know, it feels kind of weird sometimes, you know. But at some point, I found myself just giving into it. And I looked at ministers who were actually kind of cynical about the thing, who'd been ministers for 30 or 40 years or 20 years or, you know, whatever. And they were, okay, whatever. And I watched their faces change as they entered the path up above. And, uh, the path is probably as long as, as this sanctuary before you get to the arch. 
and along the path were lined all of the new ministers of this year. And they were the ones with the noisemakers and touching us and screaming and yelling and streamers as we walked down. Cowbells, you know. So we come through. And by the time I got from, in the, you know, it's like a wedding procession. They tell you when to go, you know. So I was up, so I came up. And so then the, the, the woman told me to go. So I go. And, you know, we had to walk slowly and stuff. And, and I found myself, I found the emotions welling up. And, um, <clears throat> and by the time I got to, so I get to the arch. And then I walk through. And our two leaders, uh, a minister by the name of John Waterhouse and a minister by the name of Ken Gordon, met us there. And they, they each hugged me and they said, you know, your, your ministry is blessed. And um, so then everyone comes through. And Barbara Waterhouse said, okay, I want everybody to hold hands and form a circle in this meadow. So we did. And she said, um, I want you to look around this circle. So you look around the circle and you see men and women and you see big people and small people and you see young people and old people and you see people from different parts of the world and you see, or the country, you see people you know, people you don't know, different sexual orientations, different clothes, different everything. And she said, I want you to see you are the voice of this movement. You are the one voice of this movement. We are all one. And so for me, um, for the first time in all of this stuff that's gone on in the last several years, I finally got it. It finally came to me. That those were my peeps, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that despite, despite any differences, we are one. And you want to know why? Because in that circle has been joy and tears and frustration and celebration and good times and bad times and light and shadow and whatever else that comes with any walk of life. I don't care if you're a minister, a candlestick maker, it doesn't matter. We all, we all experience it all. The laughter, the tears, the connection, the isolation, the loneliness, or whatever. We run the gamut. And, and in that circle was that. And to know that we were all blessed. We were all blessed. Because in that moment, I was able to do what Ernest Holmes says. Said, he said, look through the prism of God's love. And see, when, when, when the gentleman showed up at my table on uh, Farmer's Market, what I really, my desire is that what I, where I really wanted to go was to step in that place of not religion, but humanity, using the, 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 the prism of God's love, using our commonality using all those human experiences. I know in some religious ideas, you know, or, or I, I should say not some, every religious idea takes on at some point, if you dig deep enough into the doctrine and dogma, at some point you get into this idea of sort of the separation of what's referred to as the material or the flesh and the spiritual. And I say they are one. Because we cannot get to the spiritual without going through the material. The material is who and what we are. And that day at the meadow, that part was celebrated. You know, cowbells and streamers and noisemakers. I mean, that's us, man. That is us. And holding hands and feeling each other and... Uh, sharing tears and sharing laughter and sharing light and sharing dark. That is us. To deny that is to deny our spirituality. Because 
when, when we say in this philosophy, it's all God, 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 it's all God. It's all God. It's all God. Every bit of it. And that's how we access it. And it wasn't until I went through this experiential exercise that in terms of the world I live in, of what's called sinister spiritual living now, is that it's like I finally get it. I finally get it. It was like, and I shared this, I shared this probably within the last year sometime where I saw on PBS where a bunch of American Vietnam vets and a bunch of Vietnamese Vietnam vets, you know, came together. You know, once upon a time they were enemies and now they came together over, I, I don't know what it was. And they came together in a memorial that was actually in Vietnam. And they were just a bunch of ex-GIs, man. And they knew, they knew what it was like. They knew what the other side was like. And to watch them come together in their humanity. You know, they wrote letters home. They missed people. They carried a picture of their girlfriend in their pocket. They ate lousy food. You know, they got shot at. They got wounded. They lost people they loved. That's the humanity. And that's why after all these years, they were able to get together as one and to walk into a place and celebrate a memorial for all of them without the team jerseys on. And what, what I celebrated that day at Asilomar without the team jerseys. The only jerseys we had on was our humanity. Our humanity. I want to end today with something, with a type of prayer that is going to be kind of strange. Okay? And at the end of this prayer, I am going to ask you to say with me, I know you. And until then, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to ask you to trust me to guide you through something. So what I'm going to ask you to do is, first of all, and some of you are a little bit separate from each other, I want you to be able to hold at least one hand and possibly two. I'm going to ask you to hold hands, please. Okay? So hold at least somebody's hand. All right. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Now, if you're comfortable, I want you to close your eyes, please. And just relax for a moment. I want you to take a moment just to experience that hand. Just hold that hand. Just hold that hand or those hands. Just allow the experience of holding them to wash over you. That hand you're holding has traveled many journeys. Connected to a child of God who has experienced happiness, experienced sorrow, experienced peace, experienced conflict, experienced joy, experience sadness, experience connectedness, experience loneliness. That child of God that that hand is connected to has aspired to grow and evolve, has felt commitment and contentment, has wondered and wandered, has found answers and places to call home. That child of God has loved, has lost, has searched and found. Now imagine that hand belonging to someone in Europe. To someone in sub-Saharan Africa. 
Can you see them? To someone in Asia. To someone in the Middle East. To someone in a jail cell. To someone on a porch swing. To someone in a hospital bed. To someone in an AA meeting. To someone in a military uniform. To someone who lives next door. To someone who lives down the block. A public figure who stands before thousands of people. A lone figure living in a vacant lot. Can you see them? Can you feel them? Can you feel their humanity? Let's say together, I know you. I know you. you. I I truly know you. And so it is.